Good morning. Thank you all for uh, being here for um, what was a very good conversation last year and I hope is a uh, similarly good one this year. Um, my name is uh, Tim Hanlon. I uh, am a managing director at a consulting firm called FTI Consulting. Uh, I've spent a lot of time, too much time arguably, in the future of television and the future of emerging media and advanced advertising spaces, uh, a lot of it in agency holding company land. Um, and um, have uh, over the years uh, evolved into more of a, a consultative role to big media companies and big advertisers and big distribution firms who are all now uh, struggling with lots of things, uh, things changing by the day it seems. Um, and one of the areas that um, I think eludes uh, a lot of a show like this and the people who inhabit a show like this um, are some of the issues that we're gonna chat about today. Uh, with some very smart people who are on top of most of those issues. Uh, and that is the sort of what we call the elephant in the room, which is the sort of looming bucket of regulatory issues that uh, seem somewhat uh, arcane and distant and, and not relevant, if you will, to, say, programmers trying to figure out the new way to communicate with consumers or distribution strategies or how to sell ads or what un ad units look like and all that kind of fun stuff, which is pervasive around shows like this. Um, the goal of this chat is to kind of touch on some of the issues that wonks like us in the financial and legal and regulatory spaces um, are seeing, and perhaps some of the implications that come to the very stuff that's being discussed and negotiated in other rooms here today. Um, and some of those are obvious and are in the trades. Uh, a bunch of those things are not obvious in a very inside the beltway type stuff. Uh, so hopefully this will be a tad bit educational. I always learn something with these three, either collectively or separately. Um, but I'm going to at least uh, at least uh, uh, encourage each of them to introduce themselves and tell us where you live and what you do to qualify you for conversations around what we're calling the regulatory elephant in the room. James, would you like to begin the identification process, please? Okay, by, by all means. Um, I'm James Dix. I'm a media analyst at Wedbush Securities, uh, and I kind of travel back and forth between New York and uh, Los Angeles uh, doing that. So I cover public companies, primarily some of the large ones, uh, which we all know, TV broadcasters, um, kind of standalone uh, groups, which own um, television stations, uh, as well as advertising agencies, uh, which is how I first met Tim uh, when he was in, in more in that world. Um, and, you know, there's, if you're an investor, you know, you can kind of look at any industry and, you know, you could almost always argue that regulatory changes are the most important um, drivers of value, either good or bad for any industry. And that's certainly the case in a regulated industry where there's more, uh, you know, more sources of legal change. So it's not just courts or Congress, but you've got the FCC, um, you know, constantly, um, you know, putting out regulations and things like that. So, you know, that's why it's, it's important, um, you know, and that's, that's primarily what I look at. I, I won't necessarily look at, you know, all of the technological nuances, but I'm looking for, you know, regulatory changes which are going to, you know, affect the value of television stations or content producers, um, guys like that, because they're, they're really kind of fundamental. So you will be the... Uh representative voice of Wall Street, whether you like it or not. <laughs> yes, I'll be taking buy and sell orders at the end of the session. Very good. <laughs> Mr. Singer. Well, thanks. Uh, Hal Singer. I'm from Washington. I wear three hats currently. Um, by day, I, I work at a litigation consulting shop called Economist Incorporated. By night, I do some think tanking through a, a DC think tank called the Progressive Policy Institute. And um, I guess my weekend job is I teach a, a class at Georgetown's Business School. My, my qualifications for being here is that I get involved in, in a fair amount of disputes in the, in the TV and video space. Um, some of them include, for example, carriage disputes between an independent content provider and a vertically integrated cable operator, and those get hashed out in front of the FCC. How about that? That's more than perfect. And, and last but not least, Sally. I'm Sally Hubbard. Uh, I am an antitrust correspondent at the Capital Forum. Uh, we're a, a newsletter that focuses primarily on mergers. Uh, my experience before joining the Capital Forum was I was an assistant attorney general at the New York Attorney General's office 
in the Antitrust Bureau. So I basically wear the hat of an antitrust enforcer, and I'm looking at uh, analyzing mergers in the media and cable telecom spaces. And um, I basically conduct the same analysis that the federal agencies are conducting, um, and I write about it in extreme detail. So I was covering the Comcast Time Warner Cable merger, um, the Nielsen Arbitron merger, currently the you know, Charter Time Warner Cable merger. So that's how I've gotten kind of uh, into this media space. So why don't we start with that sort of area, sort of the M&A stuff, right? Because uh, we all sort of see the headlines and the, the mergers and the acquisitions and the conglomerization of various forms of media, but we also don't sort of necessarily in our day-to-day -day worlds recognize that these are processes uh, that may or may not have conditions attached to them that may or may not actually even derail the actual mergers themselves, right, as we see with, with Comcast Time Warner previously. So uh, in no particular order, let's just throw a few out there. I mean, you mentioned... Uh, the charter uh, pending acquisition of Time Warner Cable. There's Bright House that's sort of in the mix of all that stuff. Um, we also have a uh, French company, Altice, uh, basically on the on the docket for uh, acquiring Cablevision here in New York. Um, could we use sort of those two deals, uh, real or imagined or somewhere in between, as sort of a, a, a shorthand for the world of cable and MVPD? So maybe we start with sort of are these mergers going to happen? Are they going to happen, you know, condition-free? What are the impacts? What do you sort of see as why these things are happening, et cetera? Raw meat, hopefully, for you guys. Go ahead. All right. I guess I'll start. Um, so, like I said, I covered the Comcast Time Warner Cable merger in extreme detail, and I actually wrote a report that was published the day after the deal was announced saying that uh, the fact that these companies didn't overlap geographically didn't matter, and there was going to be a ton of antitrust problems with this deal. Everyone told me I was crazy for about a year, and then in the end, not me. <laughs> that's right, Tim didn't. Tim was one of very the few, very few people. I think last year I was debating that with Rich Greenfield on the stage, yeah, at this very show, saying that it was going to get blocked. And that's why he's not here this year. <laughs> if you make a bad prediction, you're out. <laughs> But I convinced him after that. Then he was on TV uh, talking about how it was going to get blocked. Um, <laughs> and I was not on TV. But, um, <laughs> so uh, I covered that deal in extreme detail. I think the Charter Time Warner Cable deal is very different. Um, even though it actually is going to have a lot of the same probably anti-competitive, potential anti-competitive effects of the Comcast deal, it's just on a smaller scale, and it would be too difficult of an antitrust case. The Comcast deal was already going to be a, a novel antitrust theory because it was going to be looking at the uh, back side of the market, not the consumer side, but rather the side of the edge providers and content companies trying to get through uh, broadband to consumers. And that's how they could define the market nationally and say that Comcast was going to have a 50% share of that national market. But with Charter, it, they're only going to have about a 30% share. It would just It's just kind of not enough for DOJ to feel emboldened to go into court and challenge the deal, even though actually many of the same concerns uh, that they had with the Comcast deal are uh, equally apply here. It's just kind of to a lesser extent. Uh, so I think that deal is going through. I think it's going to have a lot of conditions. I think Charter expects that. What kind of conditions? Is it, is it geographies or is it other stuff too? Um, a, a couple things they've made. Charter started out strong with some really strong um, commitments to net neutrality, regardless of what happens with the court challenge to the open internet order. Um, however, they limited it to three years, and I just think that's completely crazy. It's going to be five to seven years at the minimum, so that's going to be extended. Um, I think uh, they're likely to change the, the interconnection agreements that they made. One thing that Charter did was pretty much get rid of the, uh, the objections from Netflix and Cogent, who were major opponents to the Comcast deal. Uh, they basically told them, we'll give you free interconnection. Um, so all of a sudden, Netflix and, and Cogent were in support of the deal. However, they bifurcated it so that smaller companies wouldn't get the free interconnection. I think the FCC is going to have a problem with that and want, going to want to extend that to everyone and not give basically you know, Netflix a leg up over any kind of, which they already have obviously, over any kind of a new OVD startup. What, what about stuff like um, uh, pricing power and market power in things like uh, set-top boxes and manufacturing and uh, programming, right? We see obviously the newfound power of, I'll bring the other guys in on this too, the AT&T DirecTV combination, which right. is now the largest MVPD in terms of negotiating 
distribution now with content owners. Uh, does the FCC or any other regulatory entity kind of cast dispersion to some of that? Yeah, well, I think that the, the general framework that we should be thinking about here is, you know, when you, when you consolidate your footprint, you know, it gives you power vis-a-vis -vis content providers. And the question is, how much consolidation is tolerable? That's the magic number. For some reason, we have this idea of 30%. You know, if we get over 30%, something ho horrible is going to happen. The, the FCC's uh, general counsel, Jonathan Sallett, tried to explain the, the theory behind why they blocked, you know, Comcast, Time Warner. And the notion was that uh, if you if you allow these two to pool their their resources, they're going to be even more formidable, higher incentives and higher ability, greater ability to to foreclose against over the top uh, video providers. Um, the question that that um, that the economists community put back to them. We were kind of hoping that this theory would have been tested in the course just to see if it, if it would survive, is the notion that um, does Comcast or Charter uh, really have any greater incentive after the merger to be mean to over-the-top providers? They already have plenty of incentive to be mean. This is the, the cause of customers uh, either cutting the cord entirely or shaving the cord and going down to a, to a slimmer package. The question is, you know, what, is, what does Charter get by, by bringing on uh, one of these acquisition targets in terms of its ability to make life even more miserable for the over-the-top providers. Well, okay, so let, let's also skate, though, to some other sort of related issues here, right? We saw two weeks ago or a week ago, DOJ, I think, is starting to sniff around Comcast's ad sales power, both today as well as maybe what, maybe a charter combination and some other bigger ones also portend. Um, there's clearly already some stuff that's already happening just from a Comcast perspective, and they've been around for some time. And clearly, the going through all the records and stuff, it's clear that there's certain issues that are questionable, shall we say, in terms of local ad sales. James, have you heard or seen any of that stuff or any blowback there? Do you see any... You know, I mean, the local television broadcasters have, have always complained um, about, uh, you know, the fact that a, a local cable system has many networks uh, on which that they, they can con kind of consolidate their sales operation, whereas a, a local CBS affiliate only has, you know, their one signal. Maybe they have, you know, another, like a CW uh, signal that they can sell um, time sales for. So uh, I, I'm sure that they'll contribute. To you know, any uh, evidence that they can uh, of concerns about that um, in the local local ad market, because frankly, that's where the growth is um, for local television uh, operators, whether they're local cable systems or whether they're television stations. It's in the it's in the local advertiser market. Um, you know, national advertising placed on television stations continues to be a tough business. It continues to decline. Um, maybe that changes, um, but certainly, th so the importance of, you know, uh, the local market is only increasing. So concentration in sales of that local market become, you know, even more important. Right, I want to come back to broadcast TV stations in a second, but go ahead, Alan. I want to jump yeah, just, over Just uh, uh, kind of as a backgrounder for the audience, my, my understanding here, I think there are two issues that the DOJ is, is looking into. The first is that um, Comcast is using a, a coalition uh, to sell of, 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 of cable operators, large and small, to sell regional and local spots. And, and the concern, the first concern that I detected is that Comcast is basically in charge of selling spots even outside of Comcast territory. Yeah, it's, it's, there's, uh, you could argue, undue or certainly significant influence in supposedly third-party entities like a national NCC and there's other entities. The Canoe Project, which was ring-led by them early on, which now controls all the VOD advertising, they're substantially active, shall we say, to the point of maybe even operatingly. Correct, correct. And so, you know, I, I can I can anticipate what Comcast would be arguing is that if we're not in, you know, I'm going to pick a market. If we're not in Cincinnati, but we're in Cleveland, you know, who cares if we have the ability to sell a Cincinnati ad or, or, or negotiate with the buyer in Cincinnati? And, and I guess the DOJ would come back and say, well, if, if you guys were actually competing each other, maybe a buyer would see those as being substitutes. The other, the other issue that I, that I noticed got, got teed up is that um, overbuilders like Wild Open West and RCN were complaining that they couldn't get access to, to Comcast spotlight services. I think there, there are only two services right now or two options for uh, uh, an over the top, uh, sorry, an overbuilder to, to sell these, um, these spot market ads through. And um, well, we'll see how, how things unfold. 
Well, so, okay, so let, let me, there's one other issue to bring up, um, which is more FCC related, which is this notice for pr proposed rulemaking that's been sitting there for some time around what the FCC, or at least Chairman Wheeler, is pushing on this idea of a redefinition, perhaps, of what an MVPD is, right? I think the terminology that he or his staff have thrown out is this thing called OVD or OVP. Uh, sounds like a rap, bad rap song from the early 90s. But um, the idea of an online video distributor or provider that is ostensibly a skinnier and, shall we say, boxless package -er of linear and nonlinear services. Um, it seems to that 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 notice has sort of kind of stalled a bit. Uh, based on my reading, there's been a lot of activity and interest in that area, but it brings up a bigger issue, which I think is very relevant to this crowd: is what the hell is a distributor of television? You know, today and tomorrow. And this is maybe a bit more conceptual, but it does have some real major uh, implications for how you program, how you do advertising, how all of that works, right? Whether the FCC is follows through on this or not. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting about that is that, you know, that kind of came about as a response to Aereo um, being struck down as unconstitutional. That was the over-the-air um, signal that you could get through your through the Internet. And I think Chairman Wheeler at the FCC was trying to create more robust competition by redefining online video distributors as MVPDs to ensure that they could get access to content. Because that access to content, even Google has complained that that access to content is, makes it harder for it to roll out Google Fiber and things like that. Um, ironically, the, the OVDs came out and said, we don't want this. And I think it was the big Meaning they didn't want to be regulated similarly to what an MVD they, has been right, regulated as, right? Right, right. They don't, wanna, they don't want the obligations that come along with them being an MVPD, most importantly, the retrans. Um, they don't want to get into the retrans uh, fees situation. But I also think that there's a bit of, as a, you know, as a person focused on competition, what I find very interesting is that you're starting to see some of the larger online video distributors being less in favor of a open playing field because they realize that that creates more competition for them. So while the smaller video providers are like, great, yeah, we want to be able to get access to the content. We're in favor of this. You have Amazon, um, Netflix saying, oh, no, 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 because they know that they can get the content, right? So as, as you're starting to see these companies that used to be kind of these really entrepreneurial upstarts that really wanted an open uh, playing field and starting to realize now they're the big powerful ones and they want to keep out competition just like the cable guys do. But from a consumer perspective, actually pretty attractive, right? Because of these sort of lighter packages of things that maybe people actually want or choose to, to get and at better price points, right? So I, it's, just, it's regardless of the rulemaking or not, right? It's bringing up the issue that the definition of what a classic and or next generation video provider looks like is certainly up for debate, both legally as well as functionally, right? Yeah, yeah. And I just want to emphasize one point. I mean, Sally made it so well, it's hard for me to add much. But there's basically a split in the in the online video community. The, the, the larger ones looked at the costs and the benefits of being classified as an MVPD and said, no, no thank you. And the smaller ones, I think, wanted it. And what's, what's, to me, the interesting kind of political story is how, is how this FCC and this chairman are so willing to be led by the large uh, online video distributors. Uh, even even if it comes at the expense of the small ones. I mean, one one thing uh, from the media owner's perspective, like the content owner's perspective, I've certainly heard it from the guys at the TV networks. I mean, one of the things that gets them excited about Apple TV, even though they don't know what it's going to be yet, is that you might have a new um, competitor entering the video market relying on a largely different business model entirely. Um, and I've heard them speculating they're probably, they may well be, you know, too optimistic about this. But, you know, oh, Apple can come in, they can pay us maybe a, even a higher rate for my CBS signal or my uh, Fox signal, um, but it, they can still price uh, their bundle um, competitively or maybe even undercut the, uh, the existing MVPDs on price because they don't really need to m make a margin on their MVPD video package because they're going to be making it through devices. Um, and maybe targeted um, advertising, which doesn't have the legacy craziness and labyrinth of how the cable operator world evolved with advertising, et cetera. Right. So they see that, you know, some of these potential new competitors is potentially repricing their content up faster than the current MVPD ecosystem can pay for it 
because they can fund it out of a different business model. Well, let, let's evolve to the MBVD ecosystem into that other area that, that you've, we've all kind of basically touched on, and that's the broadcast TV station side of things, right? So Retrans, which Sally alluded to, huge, huge part of the last, let's say, decade or so of the broadcast television company model, right? Uh, and I, I would argue that as Retrans becomes more um, a heated, uh, much more uh, confrontational. Um, we have some of the regulators sort of sniffing around with things like financial interest and syndication rules and best faith negotiation efforts. We saw yesterday, the day before, uh, some challenges by some entities about it's unfair. I think the NCTA said they're claiming it's unfair for broadcasters who stream to pull their signals from their MVPD broadband partners in the midst of a, a, a retrans negotiation. So uh, James, let me start with you on this one. Um, does this even matter for broadcasters? I mean, is broadcasting even like just a, a business anymore? Uh, you know, over the air and all that kind of stuff and or is retrans basically, are we in the halcyon days of that and with unbundling and MVPDs under a lot of pressure to be more transparent and, and unbundled, shall we say, uh, are they gonna be even willing to pay for broadcast content anymore? I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, you know, I think it depends a large part on what your time perspective, time frame is. If you look over the next one or two years, this is when, you know, kind of the time frame that most public companies give outlooks in terms of, hey, this is how much we can get in free cash flow and this is how investors should be valuing us. I mean, retrans is, you know, the sine qua non of their, their business models. I mean, it is crucial. Uh, a lot of the reverse retransmission fees, which they pay back to the networks, are kind of locked in. So they have a pretty good path, and they have a pretty good visibility on what their costs are going to be uh, in terms of their network providers. So then it all comes down to, you know, how well do we need to do in our next Comcast negotiation, in our next charter negotiation, in order to hit our numbers. In five years, you can expect the networks probably to be getting a much larger share of retrans net. Um, you know, the broadcasters will collect it, and then you know CBS will come knocking on the door two years later and take, take most of it, away. take sixty percent of it away, or whatever it is. So then the issue is like, okay, okay, looking beyond that time frame, which frankly is not where a lot of investors look a lot of the time. Where's the growth in television uh, in broadcasting? Um, uh, you know, and not to, we may get to this, but I mean, I know, I know FTI put, put out some uh, research in the past month, I think, talking about, you know, the next generation broadcast standard and the potential for that. A lot of those revenue streams from that seem to be much more advertising related than fee related. Although, obviously, since we don't even have the services, we don't have the business models. Um, so retrans important near term, but but longer term, you know, if if you're not developing the content, not clear why you're going to get paid. One more question to you, and then I'll let Hal jump in because he's looking like ch ch chomping at the bit. Um, d is that a theme or a storyline behind uh, the last couple of years of broadcast station group mergers, including the what happens with Media General either as acquirer or at being acquired? Uh, or is it just one of a number of things? Uh, absolutely. If you had a better retrans deal as a television station group, that gave you uh, a day one advantage up after close on what synergies you could get if you bought somebody, because you could bring the you know the acquired company's rates up to your rates. So Sinclair had very high rates relative to other broadcasters. They tended to win most of the deals, and then Nextstar was kind of next in line or in that next tier. They're winning the deals, and that's one of the reasons why they're probably going to you know prevail with with Media General is is my expectation. Um, yeah, so the fees you know were a much clearer. Um, source of negotiating leverage for the for the broadcasters than anything they could claim in terms of advertising. Just, I want to say something by way of background, and then maybe one one new thought. But but um, you know, right now the cable companies are not allowed to play one local broadcast station against a, a say a, a, the same network, but in a different television market against right, each other. The, this is the Finson slash. Right. Good well, they, uh, ba basically a ban on, on the importation of a distant signal, right? And so the cable guys are asking for some, some assistance or a leg up in these negotiations. And, um, you know, the, the, the broadcasters come back and say, well, now, now with, there's been so much consolidation going on in cable, you've got basically four guys who control some, 79 or 80 percent 
of all the MVPD subs in the country. And so how could how could you know be fair to tilt the playing field in favor of them? And you know I am sympathetic. The notion that um, it sounds mean and evil to turn down your signal, but if you take away that that ability, you know what what bargaining chip do they have when they come to the table? It'd be like telling a baseball player that he, he has to sign with the Yankees next year, regardless. I mean his his ability to walk away is what gives him leverage. Uh, in that bargain game. The other thing that's kind of interesting is, of course, um, the chairman is trying to get the broadcasters to give up their licenses right now. Uh, these licenses will, will become sold uh, at, a, at a forthcoming FCC auction. And it's interesting that as he tilts the playing field in favor of the cable guys, it makes broadcasting a less valuable you know, uh, forward-looking prospect. And, and that could affect their, their calculus uh, as to how much of their spectrum they want to give up. Well, so, I mean, it, it, and James kind of touched on it, too, with the reverse retrans, or sort of the, the comp, uh, reverse comp arrangements that the networks and the uh, station affiliates now have. I think there's a real questioning around the value of a network brand relationship for stations the going forward. Yeah, it's primetime branding and programming, but, you know, the reality is that most broadcasters, you know, it's... A third of their programming comes from, say, a network-affiliated relationship on, 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 on average. Another third comes from another third party, syndicators, right, where they buy exclusive rights to shows. And maybe if they've got a news operation, another third is, is their own originated programming. I don't think you talk to any other broadcast. If you don't, there's no broadcaster right now in the United States that doesn't recognize that there are challenges to all three of those things, right? Even their own produced programming, right, is challenged because people of certain ages don't watch local news anymore. And you've got consortia like News On that is allowing people to basically pick and choose that local stuff without tuning in. So I guess I just want to bring back this sort of question uh, and maybe bring it to the regulatory realm. Um, post-auction, post-settlement of all that kind of stuff, and maybe a, a thinner, shall we say, stronger broadcast uh, group out there, what do the next couple of years look like for the broadcast space and world? And does the antenna talking about leverage, become newly interesting again as MVPDs maybe want to kick out costs and not want to pay for retrans and that kind of stuff, right? Could, could, that be the, the, could that be the basis of a skinny bundle, right? Broadcast antenna plus whatever other online stuff. I mean, it, you see any it's of that interesting. Yet? I mean, you, I think you sense, you see some divergence in how some of the big broadcasters are, are talking about approaching it. Um, you know, some guys like Nexstar, for example, seem uninterested in trying to develop new national content, you know, trying to use their leverage and scale to become, uh, you know, go to syndicators earlier or develop cable networks or other types of national networks. Um, so that makes you wonder, okay, um, once the auctions occurred and whatever spectrum is sold is going to be sold, you know, what is the growth engine if you're not going to do that? Um, I think kind of the next generation broadcast standard, I mean, looks to be, I mean, it's been very hard to get investors to focus on the potential for the next generation broadcast standard for years because it's always been pie in the sky way off in, the, in space. And for but, this audience, there's the digital transition that happened about 10, 15 years ago, and now there's this talk about leapfrogging to yet another new more direct and right. robust standard, right? ATMC right. 3.0. Potentially more mobile friendly and uh, potentially, and, and you know, as your, your shop, right, you know, has talked about lots of new potential business models. So instead of just retrans and advertising, you could have potentially six potential business models coming out of, uh, out of, out of that. Um, and, you know, it's hard to see you know, what other path there is for long-term growth for broad, local broadcasters other than some type of solution like that, because it seems like disintermediation is, is more likely. Well, let's skate back into sort of M&A again, right? And uh, do caps of like, you know, does, does the broadcast cap of what, is it 40%-ish right now, does that now matter given what you've sort of said and maybe some of the things that portend? I mean, is there possibly some rethought, some rethinking of maybe loosening those, those rules and maybe revisiting them either through the Cable Act and or the, uh, the Umbrella Communications Act altogether, given the world's a little different than it was even five or 10 years ago. I mean, I, I could certainly see them revisiting it, maybe not under this chairman, um, uh, but... Uh, but remember, it's, those it's, acts are congressional issues, right? Not necessarily FCC. Yeah, but I mean, they can make a recommendation, I guess. Um, but I, I suppose that, 
I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it's certainly been obvious um, what the what the re what the retrans synergies have been, and that. So the higher the cap was, the more of those deals you could do, and that's that's fundamentally what drove consolidation of television broadcasting for the past two or three years. So if you raise the cap, does that just mean you do that? You know, up to the next cap level, um, largely through retransmission synergies, um, even though those are going to start to get smaller. Um, as you know, and the advantage of one party over the other is going to start to narrow because they're all going to have, have similar retrans rates. Well, go ahead. I have to say I've been following uh, these uh, these broadcaster mergers, and I've been really frustrated with the approach that the Department of Justice has been using in analyzing them. Um, it tends to stick to this kind of textbook methodology of looking at where are the overlaps and then requiring divestitures in markets where they're going to own too many uh, stations in a, in a local market. And really what was driving these mergers was retrans. So what they should have been looking at is, you know, what is the extra bargaining power that they're gaining through the, through the mergers, and is it going to be an, an anti-competitive level of, of bargaining power regarding retrans? Um, the challenging thing is, of course, that retrans is kind of this artificial market, and DOJ doesn't like to get involved when it's a whole re other regulatory scheme. But I just thought it made no sense to be just looking at, okay, where's the overlap and that's required investitures, when meanwhile you're getting these huge companies that are, you know, t Tim and I have talked about this before, are possibly really not uh, sticking with their mandate, which was to have localism, produce local news to, you know, to have a diversity of voice. And that's the reason why they were given the free spectrum in the first place. You know, there's a public mandate. And uh, I just think a lot of that diversity and a lot of the quality of the local news is, you know, it's been news that's being broadcast across the whole system, the whole station group. Um, I, you know, I just think that this consolidation has had negative effects and it's that DOJ has been analyzing it incorrectly. Well, one question, you say retrans is kind of an artificial market. What, what do you mean by that? Well, um, in the sense that it only exists because of the um, telecom, was it the Telecom Act or yeah, the, the cable? The compulsory license compulsory, agreement yeah. uh, basically negated the copyright, copyright protection. So instead of these disputes kind of occurring in front of a court, uh, you now have them adjudicated by the FCC and all of its politicization. I mean, you wouldn't even have retrans if it weren't for this compulsory license that was um, under the cable, it was the cable act, right? Um, there will be no such thing as retrans. Right, and, and it, so uh, let me ask sort of one sort of last major question here, right? So th there's, there's no doubt that the broadcast world has benefited from what arguably, and this is another reason why a conversation like this matters, right? The rules changed in 92, 94, right? The Cable Act and, and the, re the definition of why retrans even exists now and is such a major and still growing line item of revenue for broadcast stations that didn't 20, 20 exist. 20% a year. 20% and probably growing until and if unbundling maybe changes some of those dynamics. I guess my point here is that what, what events sort of pop up like that, that, that force people to literally rethink and or revisit the master uh, oversight, the master acts and laws around this stuff. Because, I mean, Sally's bringing up a very good point, right? The idea of localism, uh, share of voice, uh, the monopoly of such voices and stuff, in a world where literally, you know, it, we're not in a world of, of, of scarcity anymore, of choice, and, and we have, uh, arguably it's the opposite now, right? There's tons of choice out there and tons of voices out there. Uh, you wonder if the regulatory environment is not only behind the curve, but like seriously lagging where technology and the real consumer aspect of video and, and television consumption really is today. Can I just make one point on that? Yeah. Um, it's, I think it's strange to, when you look at, is there more vo voice now or is there not? I think for the younger generation that's looking at so many different sources of media and looking at social media, there's a lot more voice out there. For the older generations that are watching TV, they're getting a lot less of a diversity of viewpoints. So, All right, last, last question. We've got about five minutes left. Give me some crystal ball type stuff, right? So I think, James, you framed it up. And we could, frankly, go on for another hour or two. And we can get really wonky and even get a few more people in the audience for this. But um, give me some sense from each of your perspectives. Um, what do you sort of see in the short term and the long term? I'm saying short term, next couple of years and long term maybe post 2020, 
Um, what, are, what major things are you kind of almost sort of either hoping for or even perhaps just latently expecting uh, as, the, as the dynamics start to play out as it relates to media, television, regulation, that kind of stuff? And it could be a provocative statement. That's okay, too. But, I mean, I, I'll, I'll start it by saying I, I think, as I hinted at before, I think the antenna – right, becomes a new, uh, everything old is new again, right, and becomes a very interesting pawn and or ent thing, right, with or without ATSC 3.0, the enabling unbundling or the ability to get free stuff directly to consumers. I think that's going to actually be a very interesting dynamic that uh, will come in the wake of retrans, and maybe it's challenges. Just a thought, but that's that's provocative. But do you, you want to start, James? You have one, or I mean, I mean, I would say television. You know, even with all its digital extensions, probably is going to lose share of the ad market. Um, so the issue is then, how is it going to compensate for that? Uh, and I think it's going to be more and more fee driven. I mean, that's it seems to me that that's the way it's going to go. It's probably it's. I mean, but I think the way we measure how well television is doing in the ad market is going to start to become less contingent on devices, right? I mean, we've all gone to conferences where they talk about, uh, look at the average person's time spent on uh, the mobile phone versus TV versus radio, and look at the share of advertising and everything. And it's increasingly becoming irrelevant how much time a person spends with TV on TV to the person who's got a show on the CBS network, because he's looking at you know how his ultimate is gonna depend on the revenue coming across all the different avenues. And that's the way people are going to have to start thinking about, you know, advertising monetization. Go ahead, Hal. All right. Um, I'm going to make two predictions. It reminds me of, uh, I think it was this week, it was one of those talk shows on Sunday mornings when we were kids where they they made the panelists make a prediction. But And I hope this they, doesn't get you know, me uninvited. They still have I, those shows on. Huh? <laughs> they do? Um, so I'm going to make two. I mean, it, one way, if you can go back and rethink about the Comcast NBCU deal, it, it's basically to avoid these retransmission fights. So if things get get sticky enough, you could you could envision perhaps say the AT and T, Directv, going after a, a broadcaster uh, as a way to kind of combat or to avoid uh, this stuff in the future. The second uh, bold prediction I'll make, and maybe this is wishful thinking, is uh, of course tomorrow are the oral arguments and the net neutrality uh, proceeding. And so my, my hunch is that this panel, based on my understanding of the composition and, and prior rulings, is that they could, with a certain uh, likelihood greater than 50%, um, undo it and we'd be back again either at Congress or at the FCC to try to figure out a net neutrality for a fourth time. Not that anyone's counting. <laughs> so I'm focused on broadband and uh, I think what I'm going to be looking at and what I think is really important is you know, the broadband companies have a lot of monopoly power or duopoly power just by virtue of the costs of the infrastructure, and it's really difficult to promote competition on broadband itself. However, I think the regulators are very focused on preventing the kind of leveraging of that market power into every other vertical that touches the broadband pipe, which is what the cable and broadband companies are trying to do. Um, by, you know, monopolizing, using that power to take over set-top boxes, to not have competition in online video, um, subsidizing, you know, their video products with their, their um, high profits from their broadband, um, you know, uh, advertising as well. So I think it's important to look at, maybe we're stuck with not a lot of competition on broadband itself, but looking at are they going to be successful? Comcast is certainly trying to do that with their latest stream TV. Are they going to be successful in, you know, taking over all the other verticals, or are the is the FCC and the antitrust enforcers going to be able to kind of break those, break that grip? And and to sort of wrap it up because I'm getting a, a three people who tell me how much time we have left, which is great. I see your sign over there. Um, it, it's that's this is all really really important stuff especially what you just said on the broad, broadband side of things. Because if you really think about it, and James, you kind of alluded to it, television is basically in the midst of operationally and technically transitioning from things like over the air and through a pipe to an IP type of delivery mechanism, right? All the stuff that we've seen and learned in digital media and digital marketing and advertising, right? 
have some very real effect for what, quote unquote, the future of television looks like, right? And this being the TV of tomorrow show, it's always been that way for 15 years, it's always been tomorrow at this show. Um, but that to me is like a very important part of the tomorrow, right? Because while it seems like, right, for people who are thinking that I'm in the TV business, this net neutrality thing doesn't make much difference to me or this broadband competition thing seems so esoteric, it's hugely important, right? Because frankly, and we're already seeing this with certain younger audiences, the only pipe that people may be getting in their home is that broadband pipe or a wireless delivery of a broadband pipe or maybe you have a, a broadcast version of an of a IP pipe someday, right? And if the rules of today's digital content and privacy and data around all that kind of stuff you know, aren't figured out properly with the foresight or the forethought of what television and video look like, we're all gonna be in a world of hurt and, and the regulatory elephant that's sort of circling this room comes down and has, has a seat on the table and maybe leaves a little residue before it leaves, right? <laughs> Um, so anyway, I, th that's just a, a thematic wrap up and, and maybe not the best uh, analogy to wrap up with, but I do want to thank my panelists for what I found is always an enlightening conversation. I appreciate all of you for, for sitting through it too, so thank you very much. Thank you.